Shall I start? Yeah. Okay. So, good morning. Good morning, everybody. Uh, we are now starting the second day of our course. Today will be dedicated on exposure assessment. And so we will we start from the, as we, we said yesterday, from the main issue when you want to perform an health impact assessment. Uh, where is the exposure? Who are the people exposed? Uh, and we will talk about that with uh, Keith De Hogg, is now in uh, Swiss in Basel from the TPH. In uh, case you, you then you can introduce yourself better. And they, together with Andrea Ranzi from Italy, they will talk about general principle and provide in the, in the afternoon examples of environmental exposure assessment. Then we will have again Massimo Stafoggia talking about data, where we can find data about uh, population, demographic data. And we will have a spot in the afternoon on the first lesson on human biomonitoring. So I think... Uh, uh, we, we, we can start. I leave the floor to Case uh, from Basel, and uh, please, Case, go. All right, thank you very much, Carla, and I hope you all uh, can hear me well from, uh, from Basel. Um, so we'll give you an introduction today to environmental exposure assessment, uh, go through the general principles, and give you some examples. And I do this together with uh, Andrea Ranzi, of course, from APIA and myself, I'm from the uh, Swiss Tropical and Public Health Institute in Basel. Um, and then later on this afternoon, uh, Andrea will give you uh, an introduction next to use yes, in this context and also give you a few examples of how that can be uh, applied. So that's sort of the plan. And I just wanted to check that everybody, that you can hear me okay, Andrea? Perfect. Yes, it's okay. okay. It's okay. Yeah, I, I can see you, Andrea. So I feel like okay. that's perfect. Also, when I sit down. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. okay so um, this is about uh, an hour. I think we will uh, try. So the first half, I will give you a definition of exposure. We will go through uh, some exposure pathways. Um, talk a little bit about exposure misclassification. And then we'll go really to talk about air pollution as an example in the exposure assessment. And the second half then we'll give you some examples of air pollution exposure assessments in studies. We touch on a bit on uh, using satellite data, a very new exciting uh, data source we will, uh, we're trying to use. And we give you a few a flavor of a few other studies we're finding. So that's the plan. So the first thing really is to uh, tell you or talk about what exactly exposure is. And there are three uh, definitions of uh, exposure. I hear a, a little bit of background noise all the time, but it's not me. Is that okay? I will just ignore it. Um, so maybe it's somewhere, somewhere, ah, that's it. That's better. So this is the um, exposure definition. So we have three definitions here on the screen. And all day, the real, the, the same thing in these um, uh, definitions is that we need something, an event, consisting of contact at a boundary between a human and the environment, the specific contaminant concentration for a specific interval of time. So what it really says here is that you need something which gives you the contact between uh, a receptor, a human being in this case, if we talk about human exposure, and a contaminant in the environment. So what this means is that if there is a contaminant somewhere in the environment, but there's no human exposure, uh, human um, in that environment, uh, there will not be any exposure. So really this is uh, key, being that the contaminants need to be in the same microenvironment as the uh, person or the 
human being. So that is exposure. And we can see here, for instance, what uh, pollution can do to uh, a human body, giving you some of the uh, pathways. So we see here on the left, actually, is my mouse also uh, showing on the screen? I think so, yes. Um, yes, yes, that's good. Perfect. So we have um, air pollution, water pollution, and soil contamination in this example. And you can see uh, from, for instance, air pollution, we have emissions turning into certain pollutants, certain uh, air pollutants. And these air pollutants can have different effects on the human being. For instance, VOCs, they can cause cancer risk or skin irritation, uh, particulate matter, especially has effect on the respiratory illness. So you can see that certain um, pollutants have certain effects on the human body. The same for water pollution and for soil contamination. Soil contamination, for example, uh, pesticides is a very big, uh, a good example of that, having many different effects on the human body. So you can imagine that that has some implication for if you want to assess um, exposures and what that can do to the human body. So there are four exposure processes really. Um, and they can be ingestion, inhalation, dermal contact, and external exposure. The ingestion is uh, taking it into your uh, body by eating or drinking. So this is all about uh, when groundwater is contaminated, surface water, your drinking water, but it also can have, uh, if you have soil contaminants and the fire the soil, it goes into the food and you eat it. So this is the ingestion process. The other one is inhalation. And of course, this is when you have air concentrations, uh, you breathe it in and it gets uh, inhaled in your, in your lung. Uh, and this can also go through groundwater, surface water and soil because from there it can get into the air and thus into your lungs again. The third pathway is uh, dermal contact. So here we think about water, soil and air when it gets into contact with the skin and through that skin, it can get into your, your body. So that's the dermal contact. And the last one is external and this could uh, be radiation. So radiation, of course, is not something you, you eat or you inhale or dermal, it's, it's something which uh, goes through your whole body. So those are the four uh, exposure processes and just to uh, stress how this sits within the environment and health chain. So this is a nice uh, uh, figure where you can see on the left, it starts with, uh, with the source and on the right, we have an outcome. So the source could be uh, an industrial, uh, an industrial uh, installation, a power station, for instance, and here on the, on the right could be an outcome which uh, could be an, a respiratory illness. So you need from the source, you need to have an environmental concentration. So this comes say out of the stack into the environment. And then this bit here is where the stressor and the receptor meet. Yeah. Thinking back to the definition I mentioned earlier, this contact here is what we call exposure. And from exposure, we then can calculate a dose which is something I will explain in a minute. And this, we come to an outcome. So this is this chain, and this is very important in the whole, in the whole environmental exposure assessment chain. Now there are many ways to assess exposure. And this is a, a diagram which shows you uh, in ways of, of, of position. So we, we start at the top here, with a high precision and at the bottom of a low precision of exposure assessment. The highest is what we call biomonitoring. And you will probably hear about that today or this, this week as well. But biomonitoring is where you take samples of the skin, of the hair, of the teeth, of the blood, of the urine, and measure certain 
uh, pollutants in there. Um, and that, if you can relate that to a source, gives you, of course, a very uh, accurate measurement of the pollutant in a human boy body. Um, very high precision because, uh, you know, you measure straight at the person at the individual stage. So that we call a exposure assessment with the highest precision. From there onwards, we of course start to more and more uh, model this. So here we also have a, a measurement which is called exposure monitoring. So this is where we would stick a personal monitor uh, on the human body, for instance, to sample air pollution. Um, again, it's very accurate, but it's not as accurate as biomonitoring, of course, uh, because it's not actually uh, measuring what you inhale. It tries to uh, assess that by monitoring just outside uh, your body. And you carry this monitor with you. So it's pretty good, but slightly less accurate than biomonitoring. And then we start to come into modeling because you can imagine that if you have a cohort or a, uh, a population, you cannot do these uh, measurements that well because it's uh, very expensive for a starter. Uh, it takes a lot of time uh, and you can only do a few individuals from your larger population. So what you need to do is you need to start modeling. And all these modeling uh, techniques here will give you an estimate, but there are, of course, um, uh, some misclassifications uh, attached to that. I will talk of, uh, about a few of these uh, modeling techniques, and, and you see here at the bottom, which is something I will not go into any further, but that's one of the, the lowest category of precision is questionnaires and diaries. Uh, these are questionnaires you uh, give to the population and they will um, fill it in and give you a, a sort of a subjective idea about their exposure. So it's one of the lowest, but of course also very often used in exposure assessment of populations. So this is this, how we can assess exposure. And here an example of the different exposure pathways in, in a contaminated site. So imagine here on the left, we see a, a source of exposure, a source of pollution, I must say. So here we have some uh, drums, some oil drums, for instance. They've been there, sitting there, lying there for a long time. So they start corroding and they start spilling uh, into the soil. From there on, it gets into the groundwater. From the groundwater, it gets into a, uh, a drinking water. Um, a borehole, for instance, and gets into the house and gets uh, ingested by, by drinking it. Other pathways are from the air. You have uh, volatile uh, components which get volatilized into the air and then get inhaled by uh, the children, by uh, people living nearby. Um, and another pathway is going through the soil and then gets taken into uh, biota uh, by food and or eaten by cows and oops, and from that way it gets um, into the human body. So you can see uh, schematically how, how that would work. And there's also, of course, a prevailing wind direction, which is important and we'll talk about it in a minute. So, Metrology plays a huge role as well in, in all these exposures. Another way of uh, looking at the same picture is, uh, is this way. So this is the, the same picture as, as here, but then uh, in a diagram, in a schematic diagram, again, we have the drums here, which have been leaking and sitting there for a long time. And we see the different environmental medium, so we have the air, the soil, the groundwater, and the biota. And we see then from there we go to exposure points, and from there to an exposure route to the potentially exposed population. And you see this way you can really uh, illustrate or disentangle how from one source you can have many different potentially exposed populations 
through many different exposure routes, um, which is, need, is what you need to do uh, to describe these exposure pathways. So we can actually uh, uh, calculate exposure doses and I will go quickly through that. And this is all, I, I should say also the previous slides are all from the uh, very nice uh, public health assessment guidance manual, which is uh, produced by the ATSDR, which is the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry in the US. And it's a very uh, interesting document if you really want to get into exposure assessment. And these are examples taken from that. And here we see the generic exposure dose equation. So we see D is the exposure dose. And there are a number of um, variables uh, to calculate that. And so we have C, the, the contaminant uh, concentration. So that's, for instance, the concentration in the air. We have an intake rate. Uh, which is, for instance, the, uh, uh, how fast you breathe or how much air you breathe in. You have a uh, bioavailability factor, you have an exposure factor and a body weight. This is the generic, generic exposure dose equation, but for every, and I don't expect you to see this uh, very clearly on the screen, but it just shows you all the different exposure doses available. So we have, for instance, here uh, we have uh, water ingestion, we have inhalation, we have uh, fish ingestion, uh, food ingestion, etc. So all these different routes I was talking about earl earlier have slightly different uh, dose equations. And for instance here we pick one out, the inhalation exposure dose equation, so very uh, important for, uh, for air pollution of course, and there how we calculate that is we have a D is the exposure dose uh, is a function of contaminate uh, concentration. So that's the concentration in the air, the intake rate, the exposure factor, and we also need the body weight. Um, and of course, it's very difficult to, uh, to assign values for every single person. So what they uh, did in this uh, manual, they gave you and they give you default air intake rates, for instance. Um, so we have here different air intake rates uh, for different uh, subgroups of, uh, of the populations from infant, child, girl and boy, female and male. And this is of course based on the American population that it might be different if you uh, uh, do this for a European population or for a, a national population somewhere else. But these are the the ones uh, the EPA have assigned. Uh, they also have standard default values for body weight, uh, for exposure duration, uh, etc. So this is how you can then um, do these um, calculations. The next one I will just give you to, to look into later yourself because uh, I was told, yeah, I will... Um, move on a little bit quicker. This is just a calculation and you can do that yourself, how you can actually get uh, through a calculation like this. So let's go to uh, exposure modeling because uh, what I said before, it's very difficult to measure these things and to uh, do these assessments at the individual level. Uh, what we normally have to do is we need to model for a whole population. And broadly speaking, there are two ways of uh, applying these, uh, these, uh, this exposure model. So we have an interpolation technique, and this really takes advantage of, a, uh, of measured values uh, in the environment, um, because you know, we measure at certain points, but we are interested in uh, the concentrations or the exposures uh, everywhere, not only where we measure. So we have to do some interpolation. Um, so for instance, uh, Krieging, and I will go briefly into that later, um, uh, Krieging or inverse distance weighting are interpolation techniques which can be used, uh, for instance, to produce surfaces of soil pollution, which can then be assigned to population. Uh, so interpolation, the, the base of that is, is measured data, 
We also have the second uh, uh, is the source receptor modeling. And this really is where you know and you simulate relationships between source and receptor. So for, for instance, this would be dispersion modeling uh, would be an example of this. We know, uh, and I will give you uh, more uh, information about that in a minute. So these are the two, broadly speaking, uh, ways to do exposure modeling, uh, interpolation and source receptor modeling. And then briefly, what makes a good exposure uh, measure? Well, I mean, these are quite logic, of course. I mean, they need, they need to be specific. They need to be uh, really on the specific to the pollutant. Um, they need to be accurate. I mean, there's no point in having uh, uh, very uh, inaccurate. Um... Oh, I see somebody appearing on the screen. <laughs> um, they need to be robust flexible, uh, representative, and practical. I mean, these are all logical things, but these are good to uh, keep in mind when you do an exposure uh, model. And also something we need to uh, keep in mind is exposure misclassification, because models really are a simplified representation of reality. Um, how we make generalization uh, every time we uh, apply a model, uh, we generalize about the processes, the interactions and the feedbacks, um, but the reality might of course be slightly different. So we always have to keep in mind that, you know, it's not reality. It's something we um, represent by assumptions and generalizations. Exposure models also make assumptions about the spatial patterns of the environmental hazard concentrations uh, and also make assumptions about spatial patterns of individual or populations under study. Uh, an example of this is a lot of the air pollution studies uh, assume um, we all live uh, and work at home. And we don't really move at all, which is, of course, not the case. Uh, we travel to work. We uh, work in a different place them from where we live and then we go back home again so we move around in the environment and so this is something uh, of course we have to take into account uh, as, a, as a slight misclassification. So there are various aspects of uncertainty associate, associated with each method of estimating exposure. So let's now go through the to the th theme of uh, of this, uh, also this, this this week, of course, air pollution. Now, I don't probably have to go into this uh, too uh, too deeply because this has probably already been uh, uh, handled. But just to make uh, sure, we have primary pollutants and we have secondary pollutants. So the primary pollutants are the ones emitted, um, and the secondary pollutants are being uh, created uh, in in the air, in the atmosphere atmosphere by, um, by reactions. So very important is um, where does it come from? And we have, of course, many different uh, air pollution sources. An important one is, of course, natural sources like volcanoes, wildfires, and forests. Um, and then we get to uh, cities, and agriculture, which are area sources which pollute. Uh, we have stationary sources like industrial point sources, like power stations, waste incinerators, etc. And one of the big pollutant sources are, of course, mobile sources like traffic, airplanes, etc. And it's, of course, good to know and uh, to realize uh, when you investigate a pollutant to know from where they come from. And here another similar picture um, showing the same thing. Uh, so these anthropogenic sources basically mean uh, uh, human-made sources. So these are human-made pollutants. Uh, to, so we have traffic sources here, and I want, just want to pick out that um, we don't only have uh, pollution coming out of the exhaust pipe, like here, but we also have brake and tire wear 
uh, which is also a source and which uh, are still sources uh, when you look in, uh, for instance, uh, electric cars. Uh, they, they still have tire and brake wear. Uh, so just to maybe point out that uh, although electric cars are many, many times cleaner than uh, the normal fuel uh, cars, there are some, still some pollutants uh, coming from there. And also not uh, an important uh, indoor sources in the house. And just to pick out one uh, particular pollutant, uh, PM. Yeah. So we know PM10 is uh, the largest of the particulate matter, which is all particles smaller than 10 micrometer. PM 2.5 is, uh, is a fifth of that is, uh, or a fourth of that is, is everything smaller than 2.5 micrometer. And that's something we are studying now more than we did in the past where we just looked at PM 10. And more recently, ultrafine particles, which are even tinier, which are only uh, all particles smaller than 0.1 micrometer, which is now the sort of the, the pollutant of interest in, in health research. And you can imagine that when you look at these the sizes, you can imagine that these smaller particles probably could po cause uh, larger health effects because they can penetrate uh, your lung deeper and this uh, cause more uh, damage. Just to say that the, the diesel particle, for instance, is, is indeed a, an ultrafine particle. So when you blow this the little, little one up, you can see here a diesel particle. Uh, so hence, uh, that's uh, a pollutant of interest. So we can, of course, measure air pollution. And here are a couple of uh, ways to do that uh, from uh, very expensive routine monitoring stations uh, dotted around uh, uh, all countries to uh, passive sampling techniques like here, where you oops, where you uh, stick a um, passive sampler just on the lamppost and leave it there for uh, a week or so to uh, sample. So the difference between a passive and an active sampling is that active sampling, you need a pump to uh, pump the air through the, the monitoring uh, device, whereas with passive sampling, you can just hang up a filter and this filter will then, within a week, uh, collect uh, pollution on this filter, after which it can then be analyzed. So there's many different ways of measuring air pollution. And um, there's also many different health effects uh, as attached to air pollution. And here is uh, a nice graph showing you the different health effects at the different stages of life. Uh, so we start already at birth weight. There's already uh, studies done showing uh, uh, reduction in birth weight uh, by uh, higher levels of air pollution. And you see all sorts of asthma, lung function, etc. cetera. Uh, health effects which have been associated with uh, air pollution. So it's, a, it's actually a very uh, a large list. So who is affected by pollution? Well, I mean, obviously mega cities are a huge problem at uh, these days, but not only mega cities, but also cities in Europe. They also still have high pollution uh, levels. I mean, this is just an example of Beijing in 2013 with um, pollution levels greater than 500 micrograms per cube, which is a huge amount. Actually, these days it's, uh, China is, is going down a little bit in levels. It's now uh, cities in India who are top of the list of uh, uh, most polluted cities in the world. But it's not only a problem in, uh, in those mega cities uh, in the developed, it's also a big problem in middle and low income countries. And that's mainly to do with uh, cooking and the, the way uh, they cook indoors. So as you can see here, with using solid fuels, um, cooking whilst uh, being exposed to, to the fumes coming off that. And you can see that here as well in this, in this map, 3.5 million 
premature deaths uh, per year attributed to household air pollution from solid fuels, which is a, a huge problem. So just to had to hone down the, the message, it's not just the outdoor air pollution, which is a, an issue, uh, indoor air pollution, especially in the middle and lower income countries is a, is a huge issue. Um, of course, Europe uh, has lower levels, uh, but actually we still have a problem there. Uh, also, we still have a, a problem with, uh, with health because there's no threshold of toxicity for PM. I mean, there's nowhere a level of zero micrograms per cube. So there's always a, an issue with that. And this is something actually we are um, investigating currently in, in a big project we're doing in, uh, in uh, Europe, trying to get uh, a grip of, of these how bad still is the lower levels of air pollution for health. So this is of course uh, where we are exposed um, and where do we measure? I mean, obviously we, we spent the majority of time indoors into our houses. We sleep there, we eat there, we spend our evenings often there. Uh, and then we do uh, to work, uh, we do some activities outside but mainly we spend that time indoors, but often we, the only measurements of air pollution we have are outside at a, at a routine monitoring station. Uh, so in studies, what we uh, often do, we measure also inside, of course, to capture that environment. But ideally speaking, what we would want to do is, is attach a, a monitor to every individual to get an ideal or most accurate assessment of air pollution. Um, but often what we are left with really is the, um, is the routine monitoring side outside. So with that, we need to do some assessments and, we, and I will come to that in a minute. So we do monitor air pollution a lot, especially in Europe. This is a, a map of 2008 with uh, monitoring sites measuring uh, particle to uh, PM10. In 2008, we see uh, the red dots are greater than uh, 40 micrograms per cube. And you can straight away see sort of a pattern of, of uh, PM10 concentrations across Europe, uh, where especially Italy, Spain, also in the, in the Balkan, there are very high concentrations of PM10 and they get lesser in the, in the north of Europe. So this is what uh, is happening in Europe, but this is, um, if you would make a uh, same picture of uh, a map of Africa, you would uh, hardly see any monitors. It's very much, uh, yeah, in, in Europe we monitor a lot and in the, in the US and Canada as well, but other parts of the world uh, we are uh, monitoring less. Uh, but why are these measurements uh, important? Well, I mean, one thing, of course, is you can uh, look at uh, worst uh, cases. So here, for instance, we, uh, this is a nice uh, list of monitors in different cities across Europe uh, where they uh, monitored annual mean NO2 concentrations. And we can see actually Florence uh, in Italy here on the left, uh, measuring the highest uh, pollution level uh, annual mean. So this is pretty high, 100 micrograms per cube. Uh, the guideline is 40 micrograms, so we're more than two times over that. This is a, a site obviously somewhere uh, on the roadside in, in, in Florence. And you can see nicely that, um, you know, picking up all these high, um, monitoring sites here, there's one in London, for instance, uh, Marylebone Road, uh, etc. So that's a nice way where you can straight away pick up, um, you can order these in, 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 uh, and pick up the worst uh, uh, monitors. You can also, of course, look at it uh, temporarily and look at uh, trends in air pollution data. So here we look at the air quality in London over many years. We see that NO2 levels have steadily dropped over the years, um, NOx values as well, but interestingly, ozone levels are going up uh, over time, although they have sort of 
stabilized a little bit in the latter years. So very important monitoring is to uh, keep an eye on these uh, trends uh, over time. And then we can of course model, and this is an example of a uh, three-day simulation over Europe in 2008, January 2008. These are done with very large uh, models, European models with a lot of data going in. So air pollution monitoring data will go into these models, but also meteorology, meteorological data, emission data, etc. And with that, they can then give us, uh, these are hourly uh, estimates of air pollution levels across Europe. And uh, very nice simulation, you can clearly see high levels of air pollution uh, taken away by meteorological circumstances. Uh, so that was done at European level. We also have maps at, uh, at world, at global level. This is an example of uh, a um, map done by uh, colleagues at Dalhousie University in Halifax, Canada. They modeled PM 2.5 across the whole of the world using uh, satellite uh, data. And I will tell you a little bit about that in a minute. So, what methods uh, can we then use to do all this uh, modeling for air pollution? So we have, um, I'll show you examples of four methods. Uh, one is uh, proximity-based methods. The other is spatial interpolation. Then I will show you an example of dispersion modeling. And then lastly, about land use regression. So the principles of interpolation and uh, end use statistics as a, is the uh, first law of geography from Tobler, and it says that everything is related to everything else, but near things are more related than distant things. So just to make uh, this a little bit more, uh, to illustrate this, uh, so if I measure air pollution uh, here at my home, and I measure it uh, maybe 100 meter uh, further, they'd probably be very similar air pollution uh, levels. But if I measure then a kilometer away from my, uh, from my home, or maybe even a different city, they will be uh, different. So things nearby are more related to, uh, to where you are than distant. So this is the underpinning of all interpolation and statistical analysis. So here are some examples uh, of mod modeling methods. So for proximity, we have, for instance, uh, Foronoi tessellation, which creates areas around each point containing locations nearest to that point. Uh, we can also use buffering techniques, which create zones of specific distance around points. Um, then we have distance functions, and I will give you an example of the uh, inverse distance weighting in a minute. We have global interpolators, like trend service analysis, and local interpolators like Krieging. And here we see this in action. So at the top, we see a actual surface. So this is the actual pollutant surface we are trying to model. And the only thing we have are these points here, which are measuring points. So we know at these measuring points exactly what the concentration is, but we don't know what's happening in between. So this is what we try to model. So for instance, the uh, foronoid tessellation or also called surface modeled as a disjunct surface, we see what we do, we can model it and say, okay, the nearest point to my measuring point, I take that concentration and apply it. And as soon as I get nearer to a different point, I take that level and so on. And you can see that you get a surface, but probably not very realistic. Uh, another way of modeling it would be using inverse distance. And you see you start to smooth a little bit this surface. You can use a, a global surface, which puts a global surface through the points, or you can use a locally smooth surface. So you can see you have very many different ways to go through these points. And you can judge a little bit, okay, well, probably this one here, the locally smooth surface, would probably best reflect the actual surface. 
uh, but which me method is the most appropriate? Um, I think the, the real issue here is we need validation. So we need some independent points to be able to assess how well the modeled surface uh, um, works. So for instance, what you could do is you could take, if you have many points, you could take a subset out of it. Uh, don't use that to model and then apply the model to those validation points afterwards to get an idea of how well the method works. So inverse distance weighting, this is the formula, but I wanna go straight to the example because that's uh, easier to, uh, to explain. So we have a point here in the middle, point one. This is where we want to uh, assign a uh, exposure. Um, we only have measurements here, two, three, four, five. We know the concentrations. So the concentrations at um, those five points are these. These are the concentrations. So at point two, we have a concentration of 10. At three, we have a concentration of five, etc. We also need to know the X and Y coordinates of these points because this is uh, the base of, uh, of it because we need to calculate the distance between each point and the point we want to estimate the concentrations. So we calculate the distance here then because we do a one over d square uh, inverse distance weighting, we then calculate the distance square, the one over distance square for all these points, which will give us a weight. And this weight, we can then apply to the concentration, measure at those points and add them together to give us a total uh, inverse distance weighted uh, calculated concentration at point one. So for point one, we estimate a concentration of 10.24 uh, micrograms per cube um, based on the points here and the distance to it. So that's how inverse distance wasting uh, works. So that's the, the end of the, the interpolation techniques. There's also prigging, of course, which is a very, uh, also an interesting uh, method, but it's too, too difficult to explain now, but I would, um, um, yeah, I mean, you could, you could read up that yourself, but that's, that's the sort of the most complicated one in the uh, geostatistical methods. So now we go to uh, methods which actually use um, uh, propagation models. So they, these are dispersion models, and you can see here the, the plumes, you, you see when you go outside and it's a nice day, you can see these plumes coming out of these factories. And what we want to do with dispersion modeling is we want to model and want to predict how these plumes go through the environment and how they reach us on the ground um, where we actually breathe these pollutants in. So these atmospheric dispersion models are using mostly uh, Gaussian equations to model the transport through the atmosphere. Um, and they were originally developed as a tool for regulatory compliance modeling. And they are traditionally used in environmental uh, impact assessment. They require a lot of detailed input data. So you need to know uh, emissions, uh, for, for instance, for industrial sources, we need to know uh, the characteristics, uh, characteristics of the stack. We need to know the height of the stack, the diameter of the stack, the emission rate, temperature of exit gas, etc. But we also need to know meteorological parameters. We need to know the wind direction, the wind speed, uh, the temperature, and we need to know this at a, ideally at an hourly um, temporal level. So how it works, so this is the real um, picture. We then say, okay, the, the plume goes through the air, it rises because uh, it's hot, so it rises in the air, but at some point the wind will take it with it uh, through, the, through the atmosphere. There might be some rain, so we might have some wet deposition, but at some point this plume will reach the ground. Uh, it will go over altitude levels, which will cause some uh, 
uh, different flow patterns over complex terrain, etc. Now, this is quite complicated, but thankfully, people already uh, worked on this and they put this into a, a nice uh, equation, the Gaussian plume equation, where they use a lot of these parameters you see here, but they put it into a, a mathematical equation. And this is then underlying of a, a dispersion model you, uh, you can buy from these companies. And what it will produce is, is something like this, an actual pollution surface around, in this case here, a, a point source. And this is then the, uh, the Gaussian plume uh, equation. Again, I won't go into it at the moment because we need to carry on a bit. Uh, but you can look into to this later. But this is something which is all built into this dispersion model. So it's not, uh, we don't have to thankfully do this ourselves. So what I already said here, for instance, this is in a, a typical flow chart of a dispersion model. Here, this is the, the model itself. AirMod in this case, we have all sorts of inputs we need, emission data, source data, we need meteorological station data. We need, uh, if it's in a complex terrain, we need elevation data. We need some land cover data. All that goes in together with where we know our receptors are. And then we can calculate ground level concentrations at the receptors. Um, this is an example of. Um, uh, some of these methods uh, and then overlaid with each other just to see what uh, different exposure uh, services they give. This is, for instance, a situation in uh, London where we have monitoring stations and two monitoring stations across London. And if we use the very first method I mentioned, this foranoid te tessellation method, where we use the nearest monitor to assign an exposure assessment to population, we get a service like this across London. And you can, uh, you all agree, this doesn't look very uh, uh, realistic. So the next one would be uh, inverse distance weighting. If we apply that to these monitoring sites, we get a concentration service like this. Already looking a little bit more realistic. Land use aggression techniques, uh, I will explain that in a minute, uh, will give you a surface again already a, a huge improvement and this version modeling would give you uh, a service like this. So you can see from a very um, rude, crude method of exposure assignment to what the two most accurate ones, you can see the change in exposures. So land use regression modeling then, So this is a method where we um, use monitored data and information around these monitoring sites to come up with a uh, regression model. So imagine here we have three monitoring points, A, B, and C. Uh, we measure air pollutions at these three points. So we measure NO2. These are the three uh, levels we measured. We also have different um, variables which uh, reflect the, uh, the sources uh, around these monitoring sites. So we know some information about traffic there. We know some information about housing and altitude. What we can do then is we can do a stepwise regression uh, and predict NO2 using a function of these, in this case, these three variables. In reality, this would be a, a a lot more variables we can choose from. And with this model, we can then actually estimate concentrations of NO2 at unsampled points. So here we have now where our population is living and we have also there the information of traffic, housing and altitude because we have that information everywhere. And using that model, we can then apply that to these points and get a predicted NO2. So this is in a very short, I realize I do that very quickly, 
uh, explaining land use aggression. Uh, but you can always go back and, and read up on it a little bit. So land use aggression model, the outcome variable is the is an annual average pollutant concentration. The predictor variables I was talking about, uh, we use uh, land use data, we can use road data, traffic data, uh, we can use population data. All this data basically uh, are reflecting uh, pollution sources of the pollutants. Then we do supervised stepwise forward regression. We do some checks in the models um, on uh, spatial autocorrelation, etc., And we do a leave one out cross validation to see how robust our models are. And this is for instance, an example of a model development in the, uh, in, in the UK. We see for instance at the first stage, one variable, the heavy traffic load within 50 meters comes in as our best uh, predictor variable giving us already in our square of 0.67, meaning that 67% of the spatial variation is already um, explained by this variable. So that when we do a next in iteration, we see that road length within 500 meters comes in and gives us an additional 15% of uh, explained variance. And lastly, we also get a uh, a variable which gives us information about residential area, giving us a final model explaining almost 86% of um, spatial variation of uh, NO2 in this instance. We also see that our sigmas of the uh, predictive variables are small. They cannot go over 0.1, otherwise we will not accept them. And we also check for a variance inflammation uh, factor, which means that if variables are very, very highly correlated to each other, they would be picked up with this factor. So this is how a land use regression model is developed. We did a big study in the, in the EU, in the Europe, and I will go through this a bit quick because I see that I sort of have about 10 minutes time left. Um, and you can read on this uh, later. I will. What I want to show you is really not this either. The map we produced eventually from it. Um, so here we have uh, a model, um, and we can apply that model. And this is the the nice thing about this is the, the powerful thing of land use regression. We can apply a model to the whole of Europe. So we measured air pollution in many sites across Europe here. We extracted predictive variables. We, we developed this model and then we applied it to every 100 meter square in Europe, uh, arriving at this NO2 map. And you can see as well, this graph here is, uh, is a transect through uh, Paris. So here I blow it up a little bit. You can see here, so land use regression, the red line is our NO2 estimated concentration. So you can see this is the center of Paris, the levels go up, and these are the outskirts of Paris with lower concentrations. But you can also see nicely here the different contributions of the different predictive variables. And so for instance, uh, road variables, uh, we have a, a major road variables giving us peaks of air pollution. As if you combine all these variables together, we get to these red uh, exposure estimates. Now, satellite data is something, uh, so we are recently uh, including in our models because it's something uh, since early 2000s, it's, it's a data set we can use now. You can see, I mean, this is only a, a very small amount of uh, satellites on this picture, but there's many more going around the uh, Earth. And we're using some of this data now uh, to predict air pollution uh, levels uh, on, on the ground level. Um, so for PM, we use this aerosol optical depth uh, measure. And the definition of that really is the 
it measures the uh, light extinction uh, by aerosol scattering and its absorption in the atmospheric column. So imagine we have a satellite going across uh, our globe uh, and we have the sun here. So we have a direct sunlight going through the, to the satellite and the satellite picks this up and measures it. At the same time, the same sun um, beam goes to the surface of the earth and come back to the satellite. The satellite picks this up as well. And you can imagine that when this beam goes through the troposphere, uh, it will change because of aerosols. So because of aerosols, it will scatter. So not all the light going to the surface will come back to the satellite. And the difference between this beam and this one is what we call aerosol optical thickness. So it's a measure of the amount of aerosols in the atmospheric column. So that's what we use in our modeling. And recently, uh, there's been a um, method developed to use this data. Um, and this has been developed by uh, colleagues of ours, uh, Itai Klok in Israel and Joel Swartz in the US. And they've used this method to, in, in a lot of regions, especially in the US, now also in Mexico, and Massimo, who will talk after me, and myself, we've both been applying this method now in, in Italy and in Switzerland quite successfully. And this is how we do that. Uh, so we have to, the key points here are that um, the AOD, as you remember from the picture I showed you earlier, it will measure light scattering uh, by a column of air up to the satellite. So it will measure AOD over the whole column. But we also we only are interested, of course, in concentrations near the ground. And some days we have more of the particles near the ground than other days. And this probably has been is related to the mixing height. So mixing height is this height below which particles mix fairly well. And some days the mixing height is high, which means the particles are uh, mixed up um, and we get lower concentrations at the ground. And other days this mixing height will be very low, which means that all the particles are trapped near the earth and our concentrations are higher. So this is why we use this mixing height as a variable, as an interaction term in our modeling. And this is how we do it. This is a flow diagram of our modeling approach. Um, so we do this at a, a grid level. So we get AOD data at one by one kilometer um, uh, spatial level. For some of these AOD cells, we have a, a PM 2.5 monitoring site. Those are the black dots. So if we, we can then fit daily calibration um, curves through these um, cells with PM2.5 uh, monitors and we can fit a, a model, a fixed effect model explaining PM2.5 uh, with the AOD data and this mixing height plus other spatial temporal predictors. So then we have that model and what we can do then is we can apply this model to cells where we do not have a PM 2.5 monitoring site, but we do have AOD data. So we can then apply that model and estimate PM 2.5 ground level um, estimates. So then we have all the cells, uh, we deal with all the cells with AOD data, but there's still some cells left without AOD. And these are the cells where on a particular day there's cloud cover. And if there's cloud cover, we do not get an AOD measure because it's obstructed. And clouds obstruct the, uh, the earth from the satellite. So we do not get a AOD measure, but we then apply some smoothing, spatial smoothing to still get a, uh, an estimated PM 2.5 using information from the cells 
nearby. So then we fill up this hole. Um, in our last step, we uh, estimate PM2.5 with all cells. And we can also go down in scale. Um, and that's, uh, we do that by taking the residuals of the uh, measured PM2.5 at the monitoring stations and the estimated PM2.5 at the full one by one kilometer. And with those residuals, we can then uh, apply, uh, we're using support vector machine learning algorithms to actually go down in a resolution and then ultimately uh, predict at the 100 by 100 meter resolution. So for Switzerland, I did this um, and, uh, and Massimo did something similar in, uh, in Italy. And here you can see we have uh, PM2.5 stations across Switzerland, 10 of them, which were not really enough to do this, uh, apply this method. But thankfully, we also had PM10 monitoring sites and many more. We had about 100 of those. So what we did is we looked at correlation at co-located sites between PM2.5 and PM10. And we found very good correlations between PM10 and PM2.5 at these co-located sites. And we also saw that temporal signal was very, um, followed each other very well. So what we did is we applied these um, uh, regression equations to PM10 sites without PM2.5 to uh, impute PM2.5. So in the end, we had 100 PM2.5 sites instead of 10, which was more than enough to apply method. Uh, we had lots of predicted data, I won't go into that. And what we can, uh, what we were able to do then is to model PM2.5 uh, for all these years, 2003 to 2013, at a 100 meter uh, resolution across the whole of Switzerland. So these are annual means, but we could also go down to daily in this. And here we see four consecutive days in uh, July. And we see some very uh, interesting patterns of air pollution. Um, and we see, uh, I don't know whether you know Switzerland, but around the 1st of August, it's a Swiss national day where they light lots of fireworks. And uh, so this is uh, most likely uh, the effect of fireworks um, uh, lightening off in, uh, in Switzerland around those uh, days. So that's the end of my um, air pollution um, uh, exposure assessment talk. I, there are a couple of examples here which you can just look through and maybe pick up the papers to, to have a look yourself of exposure assessment in other contexts, but because if it, it's not really related to air pollution, I thought I'll, I'll just show them to you at the end. You can then look into them later. Um, just to say that uh, Andrea later this afternoon will introduce you to geographical information systems. And this really is the base of all the work I've talked about earlier, RGI of the GIS is really the, the way to link all this data together and, uh, and a really uh, useful uh, system to, uh, to work. Um, and Andrea will explain that to you this afternoon. So that's, uh, I think you, first we get some questions, but I think then you will have a nice cup of coffee. So this was the end of my lecture. Thank you. Uh, yeah, th th thank you, thank you very much, Case. I think uh, we we have a uh, uh, quarter of 15 minutes for questions coming from the audience. Ah, yeah, I, I'll bring them. You stay here, and I okay. Oh, you can, can come here. Thanks for your good, uh, very good lectures. 
just you show in your slide uh, air pollution simulation. Uh, my question is, which one you, can hear. you used? Please, okay. you can hear the question. I, I could hear I could hear it very well, but uh, I've, I missed the last bit. Okay. Uh, thanks for your very good lectures. Uh, you show in your slide air sim air pollution simulation. Which model you used? Um, so for that, uh, I assume you talk about the dispersion model. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, this was done with uh, ADMS Urban. Mm, okay. And AD ADMS Urban is the uh, yeah is, is produced in the UK. Um, it's a often used model, but I mean there are many more, obviously. Uh, another model I've used a lot in the past is uh, AirMod, okay. which is the uh, US EPA model. Yes. And that's actually for free. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Uh, case, this is Carla, uh, because yesterday we were talking about what we can do if you don't have you know, money enough to buy the model system. And I told the students that uh, you Oh, and Andrea in the afternoon maybe can provide some link to find where it's possible to download this model because I know that someone are, some, some, some models are available for the general public. Can maybe yes. Andrea? Yes, I mean, they are available but they are uh, still not so easy to use because they are, uh, they're not nicely fit in the, in, in a user-friendly software environment. So this is the uh, added value of ADMS Urban, of course, is that it's all uh, produced in a nice user-friendly software. Whereas uh, the AirMod model from the US EPA, um, you can buy that as well in a nice software because companies have used that uh, model and, and produced a user-friendly software around it, but you can, also download the source code and use that, but that's a, that's a lot more difficult to use. Okay. Uh, I, will, I will come back in the afternoon with uh, uh, some slides on ADMS, uh, and I, I agree with, with the case. You will see that the, the interface of uh, the uh, e e ADMS is uh, user-friendly instead uh, of uh, higher mode, yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, my question is that uh, uh, you have said that uh, the models are free of charge, but my question is about the input, the data that we used, are also mm -hmm. available or not? And then, uh, uh, um, uh, in my knowledge, I, th I think that we used some experimental data for our start point for the, mo the modeling. So how, uh, how many sites or how many experimental data that we, we have used and the input for such a modeling. Thank you. Okay, so, so these are two, two questions, I think. One is about the input for uh, dispersion models, if I correctly understood, and the other one is about uh, actually the other models where we use uh, monitoring data. Yeah. Experimental um, data, he says. Yeah, so, so the, first, the first one is about input data for dispersion models. Okay, so that's, uh, of course, so meteorological data you should be able to source. Uh, it depends a bit on the country where you apply these models. For some countries you get Africa. data for free, uh, hourly meteorological data like temperature, wind speed, wind direction, etc. you could get for free from uh, the meteorological uh, institute in your country. Uh, other countries might, uh, you, know, you might have to buy that. The, the real problem is the emission data, of course, yes. because this is data coming from industry, so this is something uh, which also will differ by country. Uh, some countries, they will have to provide this. Industrial sources have to provide this to registers in their country, so this is how you could get this for free. Okay. It should uh, be public. 
uh, but for, for example, if I want to, uh, to, to model in a regional, uh, regional uh, site or mega city, in, for example, in the north of Morocco, I have only a few uh, sampling sites, four or, or, or five, that's all. Can I use interpolation modeling for uh, get an, an idea about the, all the, the city? Yes, so yeah, four or five sites is, is not really enough for giving an indication of the spatial variation across a city. Um, we minimal would think about something like 20 sites uh, to, to do, a, you know, as a minimum to start uh, doing these sort of uh, um, methods, apply these methods. So, yeah, four or five is, is not that much yet. Uh, but there are ways you could, you could um, you know, improve or, or add to these numbers by doing some uh, monitoring yourself. Would that be possible at all or not? Uh, thank you, Case. Um, before the, the next question, just to let you know that we have people here in the classroom connected via webinar for, I don't know, 25 countries all around the world, so very diff different context. Absolutely. And now, now the next. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Mutai from Kenya. Mm -hmm. Mine really may not be a question per se. Uh, it will be a compliment because finally I... Somebody has answered the question that I've kept posting on ResearchGate without uh, no mm -hmm. answer. Those of us who interacted with my poster outside know that I'm linking uh, air pollution to human health. And I'm set to defend my thesis in the next one week or two weeks, but I already know that the major issue raised by the external examiner is the practicality of using satellite column measurements and linking that to the station level human health. So what I learned from you now, and I feel so much empowered, I can go home now, is, is the, the, the use of planetary boundary layer characteristics, like the boundary layer depth and the vertical mixing coefficient, to explain the loading or the concentration of PM on the days when the mixing length is so low, then you can use that as a proxy within the earth surface. So really, mine is a compliment, and I feel I, I would want to know whether this can still be used with the other tracers, like NO2 or SO2, or is only applicable to PM. But, but thanks so much. I, I, I feel uh, I may go home now. So <laughs> okay. I found of you. <laughs> don't, don't go home yet. You have another week to go. <laughs> but no, thank you very much for that. Uh, and it's absolutely true. So this mixing height uh, is, is especially applicable for PM. Uh, I am now trying to apply a similar method for uh, NO2, which uses different satellite data, but uh, NO2 is also possible uh, to use the satellite data in, uh, in this modeling uh, approach. Uh, other pollutants uh, are not yet uh, developed yet, so this is uh, still only possible via NO2. Uh, Akis, we've, we've got other questions, sure. but could you just put maybe, we've got a, uh, a coffee cup, which is fantastic, in the middle of the screen. Could you, it's quite tempting, could you try to change and share just your face in the middle for all the people to be able to see you and, uh, and ask you questions, <laughs> if you sure. manage? <laughs> I wouldn't know how to do it, though, but... Uh... No, no, it's like you've got, you know, to, to, to on sharing the screen, okay, you've just you. got to... Okay, thank oh, you. Okay. Okay, if you don't, if you don't manage, not important. Yeah, okay, so, all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's working, fantastic. Okay. Uh, I've, I know, I've got just still, I've, I've got the, the, um, the, the mic, I've got a question from uh, someone uh, from the webinar. Oh, I did another bull. Okay, okay. right. Um, thank you very much. Closely related to the, um, the comments he made, I want to find out um, what the correlation between AOD and PM is is because, well, I'm not an expert in AOD retrievals, but I know that AOD is actually um, um, a composite. You know, you could have PM, you could have total carbon, carbon, etc. So what is the correlation really between AOD and say PM or carbon? How do you, if you have AOD data, how do you derive PM concentrations, for example, from it? Thank you. Yes. I, I mean, that's a very fair comment. Of course, the, the AOD doesn't distinguish between, uh, you know, particulates and other uh, aerosols in the, in, the, uh, in the layer. So the raw correlation between PM2.5 and AOD is not 
high. It's actually quite poor. Uh, so this is why we have to do a lot of modeling uh, in addition. And I mean, it's, it's I would, um, maybe what we could do is we could uh, give some uh, links to papers where you can see how this method is being, uh, how this method is being applied. So maybe we could do that, add that to the list, Andrea, this afternoon by uh, giving some links to Massimo's and my, uh, and my paper from Italy and Switzerland, how we apply this method. Hi, Keith. Uh, Francois Dulac speaking. To, to go on, on this topic, how can you cope on the transport of uh, high aerosol concentrations in altitude? when you're looking to these AODs, for instance, dust or biomass burning, most of the AOD is, is not at the surface, but uh, in the free troposphere. Absolutely, absolutely. So this, this is, of course, uh, and this is what I um, was alluding to earlier. So, yeah, the AOD takes care of the whole column. But what we try to do is we try to find a relation between, uh, and we're quite successful in that, in between ground level PM2.5 and AOD using all sorts of different uh, variables. So this mixing high variable is a very important one uh, that will uh, explain a lot of it. But it's, it's really, it's the, the, the crucial point of it is linking it to ground-based measurement. So we calibrate this these AOD values to ground-based uh, levels. And we don't really, we cannot um, look into these, um, yeah, these regional transport of, of, of biomass burning, etc., because that's not, uh, our model doesn't really uh, allow for that too much. Okay, <clears throat> I have another question, please. Uh, on one of your examples, you presented an equation who was uh, a point-to-point -point dispersion Question. And on your application, I wanted to know, do you apply a point-to-point -point equation or a line source emission to do the example on traffic? Mm -hmm. Is it a point-to-point -point dispersion equation or a line source dispersion equation? So, so dispersion models, they can, allow, they can take care of uh, point sources, but also of line sources. So we... In ADMS urban, urban, for example, you can uh, input uh, roads with traffic volumes. The dispersion model will then uh, calculate, uh, will then simulate the dispersion of these pollutants from traffic uh, to the surrounding environment. Um, so certainly dispersion models allow for both point and line source. I hope I answered your question. Can we use uh, Gauss Bloom model? Okay. Can we use uh, Gauss Bloom model to estimate uh, nuclear radiation concentration of nuclear radiation in case of nuclear accident, or no? Um, uh, that's a difficult question. Um, I think that that's that's a, a completely different uh, area, and I would assume there are models available to do that. I mean, nuclear, these are just, I think what you need for that are these big regional transport models, okay. uh, chemical transport models, because nuclear fallout is, of course, uh, so very large area. Okay. Whereas dispersion models typically are for small areas, like city level areas. What, it, uh, what is the uh, suitable distance from uh, the source of pollutants to, to receptor to obtain a good uh, result from uh, gauss bloom model? Oh, okay. So, well, typically, it, it depends on the source you're looking at. So, if you're looking at a point source with a very high stack, you should look around maybe 10, 15 kilometers, because this is how far pollutants will travel with wind and wind speed, etc. But if you're looking at uh, lower level sources like traffic, uh, the dispersion is, of course, a lot uh, less far away. So then you can, uh, um, the, the, the distance is, is less. Is, is that what you were, were alluding to? Uh, 
the gases or particulate matter? Sorry? Gases? Yeah. Or gases? Gases, uh, gases or particulate matter? Were you uh, talking about gases or particulate matter? Yeah, well, they're both actually. Both. I mean, the, the, the dispersion model will take care of both, and also the, the dispersion of these will, will be typically uh, in those sort of distances. Okay, I think we don't have any other question from the classroom. We have some from the people attending by webinar case, so please. So we, uh, we just got uh, one question from Noor from Jordan. Uh, it's, I mean, it's a bit like the question we just had now, but I'll just ask you. Uh, she was just wondering how many uh, monitors are needed in an area of known size to get good predictions, and should they be equally spaced either a mm. method to determine the location or the distribution of monitors beforehand? Yeah. Okay, that's a good question. I mean, um, so I said earlier I mentioned 20 sites, but that's a really a minimum. I would certainly uh, aim higher. I would like uh, typically something more like 40 sites. These 40 sites, uh, they, sh they don't have to be um, uh, equally distance away from each other. What is more important is they, that they reflect different areas of traffic pollution, levels of traffic pollution. So we would like some sites near roads, we would like some sites away from roads. We want to capture all the different levels in our study area. So that's more important. But I mean, there are some papers written, and again, we could uh, add another paper from Gerard Hook uh, on uh, land use regression to this list. Uh, so th thank you, Case. And then we have an, the last problem. No? Yes, okay. okay. Um, uh, thank you very much for an interesting uh, presentation. So you talk about uh, satellite optical uh, techniques that can be used to reflect somehow the stress of the pollution. So I have uh, a question about can the satellite thermal imaging can reflect the stress of or air pollution somehow? especially that we have been learned here from the first lecture, there is very correlation between the temperature and the air pollution stress. Um, I'm not really understood the question totally, sorry. Have you heard yes. correctly or not? Yes, we, I, I heard, but I don't not completely understand it. Maybe can you come I here, ask I can about, see you talk. I, Okay. I ask about the thermal imaging. Can be reflect imaging. yes, can be reflect somehow the stress of the pollution because that we have been learned that there is same correlation between the high temperature and the air pollution. Ah, okay, okay. Um, yeah, that, that, that's into I mean of course uh, we we certainly temperature is one of the variables we uh, allow into what we have in our models. So temperature is very much a predictive variable of pollutant concentration, so that's, that's correct. We actually haven't uh, used satellite data, temperature satellite data, to inform our models. And that could be, of course, also an interesting uh, way to do it. What we do, though, is uh, we do estimate temperature levels using the term thermal imaging. But that's a good point. Okay, thank you very much, Keith. Eric uh, speaking. Eric Amano, I have a question about, you said that it would be best to have uh, monitoring, individual uh, monitoring, uh, using some monitors that you could wear, uh, take with you everywhere you, you go during the day. And I wondered if you have, you have uh, already uh, a set of those monitors that are uh, maybe validated, maybe uh, uh, not cheap, and could have a package that we could uh, propose here in this, in this audience and say, mm -hmm. if you use this kind of monitors, then you, you get a, a good uh, exposure measurement. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm afraid I, I can't um, um, recommend anything at the moment. The, the, there are good, validated methods available, but they are very expensive still and uh, require uh, quite yeah, expensive monitors, air pollutant monitors, and they're not heavy, uh, not light, they, they're quite heavy still, and they uh, require a lot of uh, effort. The so-called more uh, low-cost sensors are still 
I would say, unproven in, in their uh, accuracy. So people are using them now in studies, so they're certainly available, and there's a lot of these uh, sensors available on the market. Um, but I don't, I wouldn't dare to uh, recommend any of them yet for, uh, um, for a study, um, because there's still a lot of uh, inaccuracies uh, attached to them. Mm -hmm. But I know a lot of studies trying to use them and, and uh, but we, we could certainly give some um, links uh, to maybe some, some of these senses we trust more than others. So maybe that's a better way of phrasing it. Please. Last uh, question. Yes, I have another technical question uh, for the motor insight. What is the uh, minimum required period for uh, sampling measurement that we ca can uh, use for modeling uh, uh, calculation? So, uh, sorry. I, 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 the minimum it? required period for sampling measurement that you can use for multiple sites. Okay. Um, so we, we there are many ways of, of doing this, of course. Uh, so it depends a bit on the, the air pollutant you're interested in. So if you're interested in NO2, there are um, passive samplers available, which are very cheap uh, to buy uh, and which you could apply at many locations, which you could leave out for, say, a week uh, or two weeks to get a two-week uh, or two-week uh, average. So that's available, but you, if you're more interested in particles, you really need to go to, uh, uh, to active sampling. So there you need some more investment to get a, a pump and, uh, and, to, uh, and filters. So this is, yeah, it really depends on the, uh, the, the type of pollutant you're interested in. And, uh, also, the uh, role resolution you want, whether you want it uh, by minute, by hour, by day, etc. Okay, I, I think uh, well, we have all thank you very much, Case, to be so kind to sitting, <laughs> standing in front of your screen for more than two hours. So we really thank you. Excellent. And uh, thank you. <laughs> Okay. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for uh, allowing me to do it remotely. I would have wished to be in, uh, in Trieste, of course, myself, but uh, maybe next time I will be able to. Uh, okay, thank you. Okay, I think now. If, if anybody yeah. actually has, has more questions, uh, I don't know whether you, uh, there's an email address that you could maybe provide. Yeah, we will provide, yeah, all day. More than happy to, uh, to answer questions also by email if people. Okay. Think. Okay, okay. To come into contact. Okay, so thank you very much, and for now it's time for coffee for you to case go and have a coffee. <laughs> thank you again. Okay.